you can learn data structures and algorithms from anywhere. Like there's so many places on, you can learn it for free, but like, how, how do we know for any given problem that it is the right answer? How do we know you can't do better? Like, how do we know that this is the one that the interviewer is looking for as well? Well, there could be an array of real ways to solve the problem. How do we know which one the interviewer wants? And that's kind of what the mic framework kind of solves. And I don't mind giving you the farm here. I'll, to, I'll walk you through the whole thing. It's pretty straightforward. The, the four steps just at a high level to go minimally sketch the naive solution to the problem. Um, and we'll come back maybe to each one in a second, but minimally sketch the naive solution. And then the next one is I for infer boundaries or, you know, identify boundaries. And that boundaries refers to time complexities, like what's the worst case and best case that we could possibly get. A K is about keywords. So using clues within the problem itself, keywords within the own description, we also call them triggers in order to identify possible approaches and ways to solve the problem. And then E is what's really unique uh, for the book where there's a huge chapter on this. That's uh, called it's employee boosters. So it's the only one that doesn't really fit super well with the acronym, honestly, but we're going to employ boosters. And boosters are this idea of once we kind of have all of our information about the problem, we know the easy way to solve it. We know what our boundaries are. We have keywords and approaches sort of mapped out. If we're still stuck, what do we then do to kind of move forward? Some people find drawing an example is helpful. And people online maybe are like, hey, draw an example. And that kind of works. But there's about 20 other techniques in total that you can actually use besides just like, you know, the one-off ones that you hear people talk about. And we sort of put them all into a framework to kind of use. And then the boosters themselves are their own mini sort of framework as well. So M, minimally sketch that naive solution. I is infer the boundaries. K is keywords. And then E is employ, bound, uh, employ boosters. And we sort of walk through that to solve a problem. Sometimes you need to do these steps, all of them. Sometimes you only need to do one or two before you get really what the, the answer will be. And besides starting with that brute force where we, you know, sketch the naive solution at the beginning, the rest of it's pretty free form as to like where we can go from there. Basically, when we initially are doing practice, maybe you actually go through and you're like, okay, this is what it would look like. You don't code the whole thing, but you're like, this is kind of what it looks like. I say pseudocode, um, but the problem is when you say pseudocode, people start writing, especially if they're Python users, they start literally writing code in like a, a common string or something somewhere. So I like to say indented English and all that's supposed to represent is this idea of like, look, if you've got a major for loop or nested for loops, you want to kind of showcase that, that by indenting. But in general, it should just be like in English, what is your algorithm doing? Breaking each step apart to where each line is essentially like a line of code in Python. And you don't necessarily care about off by one errors. You're not focused on like, do I plus one here? Or do I minus one here? What exactly is the while loop conditional? None of that kind of stuff. We don't focus on those. Um, tricky code expressions. And we just think like, if this worked perfectly, what's the general idea? And then once you've got that, then you know what you can optimize. A worst case is usually what the brute force is. So if we have three sum is a classic uh, question that people kind of use as an example. So three sum is you start off and the brute force way to do it, the naive way to do the problem is just three nested for loops. So it's very simple to sketch the minimally like sort of viable way of doing the, the problem, but it's a terrible time complexity. It's that cubic time complexity. So that represents our upper bound. We also know that for a lower bound, we want the lowest possible one. And we can kind of reason about like what is the lowest best way we could possibly think of, of doing this. And we can start reasoning about like, is it possible to do this instantaneously? Well, probably not. Uh, is there maybe a formula that makes this O1? Probably not. We probably need to at least look through the array in total for this, you know, three sum problem. We need to at least look at every element. So it's probably we're bounded by linear time. So then we have this way of sort of bracketing. It's like, okay, so it's linear time as the, the lower bound. And then as the upper bound, it's like cubic time. Okay, now what are all the complexities that exist between them? And then more importantly, what do those complexities map to? There are data structures and algorithms that literally map to these complexities, and we can use that to derive what approaches to actually follow. Right after we sort of set up our boundaries, that is one way of identifying approaches. But a separate way that a lot of people do naturally is just looking at a question and saying, there's a keyword in here. Like uh, if you have a question about parentheses or something like that. Most people, after having done these question lists, put together the fact that if there's parentheses in the problem, maybe I need to use a stack. And that's sort of like what the takeaway is. All we do is we formalize the process and we remove the, the need to do 100 questions before you get the pattern. We just say, hey, when you see this word, it means try this thing. So we then sort of start throughout the entire catalog of data structures and algorithms in the book as we build it up. We're like, hey, here are the keywords associated with this thing. If you ever see this, this is kind of like the approach that we should consider taking. And for any one problem, you might get, 
you know, three different approaches that come from boundary thinking, and then maybe another four approaches that come from this trigger thinking, this, these keyword kind of analysis. And then when you look at them together, you're like, well, sometimes there's overlap and it's like the overlap, we really want to make sure maybe, maybe that's where the, the secret sauce is. But if there's not overlap, then it gives us two separate places to kind of work through. And it's only when all of those options fail, that's when we sort of say, okay, now let's employ boosters because we have to, we have to come up with something radically different. Let's kind of go from there. So I think this is actually the biggest downside to current thinking when it comes to doing like leak coding in general. It's like, I'm just going to do a thousand problems and this experience is going to benefit me because then I'll just know exactly what to do. And there's a word in German and I don't speak German, so I'm going to do this rough translation here. It's called Einstellung. Um, and the, the word, as I understand it, roughly means <laughs> it <should> be, <laughs> it's Einstellung. Um, and I, I could be butchering the name. Honestly, I could be really butchering it here. But my understanding uh, of the word is, is something like experience can hurt you. And this is perfectly illustrated in like sort of this, this keyword thinking, this trigger thinking, because you develop this experience of like, I see this thing, therefore I do this. And that in of itself is a fine framework to use, but it can't be the only thing you use. You're, again, this is people relying too much just on their past problems that they've done as experience. So the boundary thinking is one of the ways that we sort of help get around it. It's why we marry the two together as sort of the next steps. So the boundary thinking helps say like, hey, you're thinking of doing something, but this is where the time complexity is for doing that thing. But we know that the boundaries are lower than that. So don't do that. And that's kind of like one of the ways that we know it's not a valid answer. There's maybe sort of five use cases for it. We break them down into like each each booster has their own sort of like subways of doing things. But the, the high level is essentially five different categories. You sort of have you turn to each category depending on the situation you find yourself in. So if you've sort of exhausted the brute force, or you, if you've done step I and K and, and you still don't know the answer to the question, we start with sort of the first booster and we say, what are ways to optimize the brute force as it currently is? I already have done the work of seeing what the brute force is. I have it laid out in front of me so I can see where the bottlenecks are. And then there are a couple of boosters just around how do we optimize this and make it better? Now, sometimes that works and that's kind of enough. And those boosters help in those scenarios. Other times, however, you get a problem where the, the trick is actually discard the brute force altogether. Ex you know, don't use that approach. You need an entirely new approach. So then we have a whole series of boosters around how do we come up with a new approach once we've we've exhausted sort of the, the initial ways of doing the problem. And then further beyond that, we have, again, another couple of ones that sort of are like, depending on what situation you find yourself in as you go through the framework you then sort of have a choice and you action on that from there.